thank you for joining us today to learn more about um, Strong Coast uh, NSF Research Traineeship Program. And um, we're glad you could be here to join us. And we're looking forward to sharing a little bit more about what makes this program really unique and an exciting opportunity for uh, doctoral studies. We have a, a diverse and very interdisciplinary team of uh, researchers, uh, postdoctoral researchers, uh, and affiliated faculty. Uh, these are some of the, the folks you see here. Uh, Dr. Maya Trotz is the PI, uh, our fearless leader. Um, we have uh, Sanai Habitus from uh, University of the Virgin Islands. Uh, I'm Rebecca Zarger. I'm an environmental anthropologist. Uh, Jane Zhang um, is not with, with us here today, but she's also one of the co-PIs, and Dr. Jim Mahelsek. Um, and we have uh, a really dynamic team of environmental and um, nutritional food uh, anthropologists and uh, environmental anthropologists who are uh, a part of our team. And um, here we have some of our wonderful uh, trainees. Um, I don't know if folks want to maybe just introduce yourselves around the table. We're all relatively yeah, grateful to be here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm so happy to read them off here. Yeah. 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 All right. Yeah. 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 All right. Yeah. 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 All right. I don't want to do that. Most folks are here. I'm Alex. I don't know if you can see me. Um, I'm an environmental anthropologist working in Belize. Hi, I'm Cassandra. I'm also an environmental anthropologist working somewhere in Belize or Virgin Islands or Barbados or somewhere. You know, just the whole Future spectrum. Open. I know, very open. I am Michelle Fox. I am an environmental engineer working on coral reef restoration in Florida Keys. Hi, I'm Addie Bjork. I'm a environmental engineer um, working in Madagascar. Hi, I'm Arthur Bentil. I'm an environmental anthropologist, although also an environmental engineer, but, and <laughs> I'm working in uh, Belize. Thank you again. Perfect timing. Oh, hello. <laughs> 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 you can just yeah, just, um, oh, you actually <laughs> I am an the Sunny Ortiz. Um, I am a second year PhD student in uh, environmental engineering. Hello, I'm Maya Garcia. I'm an environmental engineer working on environmental justice and stormwater management here at UC Santa I am Daniel Delgado, and I'm also an environmental engineer working on uh, on site wastewater treatment systems in Belize. And Hi, I'm Michelle. I'm an environmental engineer, and I'm working on perceptions of water reuse in St. Thomas. Okay, so you've met our motley crew, and um, <laughs> so should I, yeah. right, um, so we'd like to uh, just share with you a little bit about um, what guides our work. Um, we have a, a really um, strong focus and commitment to community engaged research, um, but we also have a, a sort of guiding research question or mission, um, which is what you see represented here. Um, and this is looking at um, trying to understand leverage points and drivers behind uh, sustainability and resilience in coastal areas uh, in the Caribbean. And that also includes the Tampa Bay, the Florida area. Um, and so our guiding research question is this um, focus on leverage points and food, mm -hmm. energy, water systems within a specific geographic context uh, and trying to uh, understand the dynamics behind future sustainability within that system. So uh, we take geographic context to really be a very broad sort of cultural, historical, political situatedness of food, energy, water systems. And uh, a lot of our interdisciplinary coursework and training is um, aimed towards bridging social science, uh, ecological science and engineering science uh, together to answer these really uh, very pressing and urgent questions around creating more sustainable coastal communities. Someone want to help me out with this slide? 
Yeah, so as Dr. Gargan mentioned, we have a project situated within the U.S. and the Caribbean, and so the spaces that are highlighted, um, Tampa, Belize, U.S. Virgin Islands, and Barbados are kind of the hub of our sites um, for strong coast, as you can see from this map. And these are... The little, the little lines you see are the our hurricane projections. Um, and so the point is to highlight that all these communities are vulnerable to um, future uh, climate change effects. And so that's the reason we've chosen them. Just, just a little correction. Those are not projections. Um, reference, the reference oh. on this slide somehow has been lost, but this shows sort of the map of all the different hurricanes that have come through the region um, over, since we started recording hurricanes. So don't listen to me, it's also <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Maya. Um, so uh, th this uh, NRT grant is, um, uh, as we mentioned, it's an NSF funded, a traineeship that combines opportunities for uh, integrative coursework, uh, field work, doctoral, student research, funding opportunities that relate to both um, sort of doctoral funding at USF and then also uh, for um, smaller team grants um, that we call uh, challenge grants. And the uh this grant is kind of a continuation of a previous grant at USF, working with anthropologists and engineers, um, primarily in Belize, and it's now been extended to the other sites, um, that's really focused on how to collaborate uh, between these two kind of uh, disciplines that have very different uh, perspectives on these issues. Um, so the first one was done from 2013 to about 2018. Um, and that was a, um, a, a NSF Higher Grant, which is Partnerships for International Research and Education. Um, and it was also a, a multi-sided uh, grant uh, that brought together uh, anthropologists, social sciences, marine sciences, and en environmental uh, engineering. And uh, students were engaged in training opportunities and research uh, in Europe, in the Caribbean, and one of the major sites um, where you had anthropologists and environmental engineers in the field together was in Belize. And so one of the perks of the program as it is now is that it has a lot of, uh, the, the leaders of the project have a lot of experience with interdisciplinary collaboration and that uh, there's a lot of social capital at each of these sites um, in terms of access to stakeholders and that kind of thing. And so it, it makes this kind of streamlined. So one of these, things about this program is when it comes to the actual training aspect of it. So it is interdisciplinary between anthropologists as well as engineering. And at the core value of it is really trying to create an environment where both of the disciplines, although they're different, can work together to kind of create more meaningful projects. Um, one of the courses that is currently occurring this fall is called um, the Systems Thinking for Food, Energy, Water Systems, where um, Anthropologists as well as engineering are coming together to really focus on how a fuse the food energy water nexus can really be modeled through systems thinking. As well as over the summer, there's a community engaged research global component through the Global Fuse program where we go to one of the research sites to actually do projects there. Well, if you could you just go back one slide, Michelle, please. The main outcomes that we have for trainees are this idea of interdisciplinary research and education, systems thinking, community engaged research, and then global competency. And I think what the fellows are gonna do now, they're gonna walk through some of the core courses that are required as part of the program. So this is our Strong Coast Engage course. So this is the course that we had in the spring, summer, and in the fall as well. And this is where we come together to understand the outcomes of the project, the field work, and actually we do a lot of planning. Um, as you can see in the first picture, we were looking at causal loop diagrams to understand um, effective sci um, scientific communication. And then we later had a, um, a seminar on this. And we've also had guest speakers 
and professors come in as well um, to give demonstrations about their research to tell us specifically what they were working on. And we've had private sessions where we meet and plan for the, the future of our project as well. And just kind of adding on to that, just a, a little bit, um, one of the, um, the other goals of the Strong Coast Engage weekly meetings is um, to give our trainees an opportunity to build community around research and around the, the engaged uh, community projects that we're working on together. Um, it also involves some uh, communication uh, skill sets, thinking about ways of sharing our research in non-traditional formats, um, thinking about uh, you know how to share your research with policymakers. Um, we've also had some sessions on uh, how to write a press release, and uh, so it's a an opportunity to get together weekly and um, sort of think through uh, some of the challenges and planning uh, for future research together. Um, and also learn more about the resources that we have available on campus with different centers, um, faculty members, and research teams. Okay, so um, <laughs> the, uh, the systems thinking for food, energy, water course is one, um, uh, as Chrisanne mentioned, <laughs> uh, is um, ongoing this semester, and um, the uh, the course is actually it's a not just a co-taught class, but it's uh, a, a triple team taught uh, class with um, um, myself. I'm one of the instructors as the um, anthropologist on the team, and then we have two environmental engineers, um, Dr. Christy Cowdy and Dr. Jim Halsick. Um, and Dr. Uh, Jane Jong um, are all co-instructors on the class. And um, it's geared towards an understanding of what food, energy, water uh, systems are, our current sort of state of the field of understanding um, from a variety of disciplines. Um, we thought a lot about uh, assessing where the, the integration of those different systems is um, with regards to research and, uh, and a bit about policy. Um, we also uh, come at the uh, thinking about food, energy, water systems from a critical perspective and assessing not only what gaps exist in research, but where a very uh, integrated interdisciplinary team like ours might be able to contribute to that type of research going forward. And one of the key ways that we have thought through this um, is by uh, getting a, a, a broad understanding of systems thinking from a variety of disciplines. Um, and then it also uh, culminates in a proposal for uh, a team challenge grant um, that is potentially funded by the Strong Coast Project. So. so this next slide covers the FUSE goal course that we need uh, all over the summer. Um, this past summer, we went to Placentia Belize and spent some time partnering with communities and organizations there to investigate the food, energy, water nexus within this community. Um, we looked to help develop solutions for some of the problems we investigated. We spent some time um, not only in the Placentia Peninsula, but then also on the Keys, looking at their coral reef restoration and wastewater systems. And then also up in the Maya Mountains where we were exposed to some agroforestry and um, worked with certain communities there about their um, sustainable farming practices and also how to best protect their mountain communities. So this slide covers some of the regions that we partner with. Um, as I mentioned, Belize, also Barbados, the state of Florida and the US Virgin Islands. <laughs> Uh, so this was a picture from our trip during the summer in Belize. Uh, this was at Laughing Bird National Park. It's a site where they have coral restoration going on just off of the key, but they also have a lot of tourism. So that's right behind. Uh, you'll see that building that's an outhouse, and that's a wastewater system that they have on the island. But on the uh, background picture, you can see the coral and the mats of algae covering it. So they... Uh, uh, they, have, they have a nutrient problem going on in the area, and as, um, as 
my research is on on-site wastewater systems, but this is also incorporating um, uh, coral um, coral research and uh, a part of the for the fuse course uh, the challenge grant um, with the team of uh, four other people uh, Michelle Alex and Stenia and we are uh, trying to find solutions to this problem so it's like a way to take our research um, and incorporate it into the area and solve real world problems. And this is one of the system diagrams that um, you see me and uh, Alex, Dr. Prouty, and, and Dr. Zarger, and also Mr. Mr. Garcia uh, participated in. So this is just an overview of the situation on Laughing Bird Key, um, kind of how the, the tourism is leading to an increase in uh, uh, nutrient problems in the area and how that's affecting the environment. Um, this was my first time making one of these uh, system diagrams, and that's Probably, I really enjoy it because it's a, it's a nice way to present my research and it kind of helps me to, to show it um, and hopefully it'll, it, it helps other people understand it. So another project that we have in Belize is seaweed farming at Little Water Key. Um, and so essentially what seaweed farming is a type of marine culture that is ever expanding um, in the Caribbean and other parts of the world. And um, it also contributes to sustainable livelihoods. So pictured here is the head honcho of seaweed farming, <laughs> uh, Mr. Lowell Godfrey, also known as Jack. Um, and so this summer we had the opportunity to you know, do an interview with him and talk to also local uh, residents in Placencia and just kind of get an understanding of what seaweed means to the residents in Placencia and what do they do with the seaweed. Um, and also, what are the requirements that go into seaweed production um, as it relates to you know, food, energy, and water? So that actually goes into the next slide. Um, and so these were one of the outputs that came from the course. Um, and so uh, I worked with my partner, Michelle Henderson, and our leads um, and Strong Coast to make this system diagram and essentially I know there's a lot going on here but the, the gist of it is looking at you know how these food energy and water dynamics affect uh, like entrepreneurship or potential um, contamination from both so as an example you know we have food and it's a sustainable seaweed farming practice so there's nurseries there and this contributes to food security if we're looking at water and how um, you know water comes into play with these dynamics you see that in the seaweed production process, there is a demand for fresh water. And so, you know, if they have this at the key, you know, how does this affect, if, you know, the limited supply, how does this affect, um, you know, transportation costs, if they need to bring water from the peninsula, you know, and then how does that affect the cost to the consumer of the seaweed and things like that. So that's kind of like the general gist of the this is diagram that we have here. Um, and then on the next slide, this um, this is a part of the outer loop that you might have seen. Um, but we're looking at potential heavy metal accumulation in seaweed because seaweed does have the um, it has a high affinity for heavy metals. Um, and so that's what several of us in the Strong Coast cohort are working on. We're working in the lab um, to see where is this accumulation happening. And then another part that we want to work on uh, potentially next year is uh, looking at quantitative microbial risk assessment. Um, yeah, let's see. <laughs> so then we went to the ridge side of things of the coastal region. So we went high up to the, well, not very high, but up to the, um, the Maya Mountains to see what the Yache Conservation Trust is doing with the uh, local farming communities to sort of have um more overall i guess sustainable way of doing farming and also incorporate ecotourism in that thing this is in toledo district of belize um so we were looking at how different land use practices affect riverine environments and how they then again affect the coastal regions and coastal waters and sort of what drives those different practices along the uh, areas. So my name is Wanella and I'm an environmental engineer and PhD candidate here working in Barbados. And what you have in front of you here is a map of drinking water tank systems that have been installed across the island of Barbados as of, this was July 2018 from the utility. So a little bit of background in Barbados, they have um, 
had a what has been dubbed on social media as a water crisis where persons in parishes in the northeast of the country so like St. Andrew, St. Joseph, St. John, St. Thomas were not getting water um, either because of breaks in the infrastructure or breaks down in the energy energy for pumping so the utility started this program called the personal tank program where they have been installing these drinking water tank systems at household so part of my job here has been to create a gis database of the existing tank system so collecting information on not only location but what types of complaints or queries are your persons um your customers asking for changes so that this could inform changes with the technology design as well as how the program is implemented because this program is going to be extended in a larger project called water sector resilience nexus for sustainability in barbados that is um, being executed through collaboration with the caribbean community climate change center and funded co-financed by the green climate fund so about another 1500 of these systems are earmarked for starting next year for distribution on the island um, so that's part of what part of the work that we're doing in Barbados. So kind of shifting gears from Caribbean islands to Florida, I guess before I get started about explaining our work here in East Tampa, um, I just want to kind of reiterate the fact that a lot of the projects that I've mentioned so far, as you can see, based on the collaboration and the community that we've been able to build, and Strong Coast has organically kind of led to this, I guess, culture of being able to collaborate with each other across disciplines to create different um, and unique research projects, whether that's in the Caribbean or here in Tampa. And so focusing on our research here in Tampa, um, my research focuses on East Tampa, which is a community <coughs> development area. A little backdrop, um, USF has a history of working in this particular community, um, as you can see from this slide. Uh, it is what we consider to be an environmental justice area, um, predominantly African-American population, uh, average per capita income of just under $12,000. But one of the unique things about East Tampa, as you can see from the map, is where it's located within the city. And so it's sandwiched right between I-275 and I-4. And as you can imagine, based on its location and even its complex history, um, East Tampa experiences quite a bit of uh, challenges, not just environmentally, um, but also kind of touches on that socio-political um, and cultural dynamics that would impact, impact something like infrastructure. And so my research focuses specifically on stormwater management in this community. There's 34 stormwater ponds, which you can't see on this map, but I'm just trying to give you as much history as possible so the project makes sense. Um, so there's 34 stormwater ponds in this community, um, most of which are not as well maintained based on standards um, expressed by the community. And so a lot of my research has been um, working with different stakeholder groups from community residents to city management um, and even university faculty to better understand decision-making processes that impact infrastructure in this community. And again, this kind of touches on not only the infrastructure component of the stormwater, um, but also touches on some of those complex socio-political dynamics. So if you go to the next slide, um, you're seeing quite a bit of so, uh, systems model. This is a very simplified model, but just kind of looking at some of the um, dynamics, again, that would impact something uh, like management in this particular community, whether that's um, public input, and that can be tax dollars based on the fact that it's a CRA. There's tax dollars that go into um, adjusting or uh, improving infrastructure in the community, uh, community perception, and then the state of the pond and park is impacted by a variety of different um, factors. But again, as you can see, the systems model have been a way for us to communicate some of these complex dynamics that, in, that take place in communities that we work in. Okay, so shifting back to the Caribbean. Um, <laughs> right. <laughs> um, so I'll be, I'm Michelle, and I'll be working in St. Thomas. Um, so as most of you may know, St. Thomas was hit by what is dubbed Irma, Irma Maria, which is Hurricanes Irma and Maria. Um, and with that, the Caribbean has to be very resilient in terms of hurricane management and also climate change because they have experienced the effects of these disasters more than we would inland. Um, so I'll be looking at the perceptions of water reuse for food crop production. Um, so one of the things that happens um, during hurricanes and just in general is like ways to find food um, become less open and water as well. Um, and the price of electricity in St. Thomas is about three to four times more expensive than the most expensive state in the United States on the mainland or in Alaska. Um, and water is designated in this area to be collected by cisterns, but a lot of times um, water runs out and 
St. Thomas is actually having very irregular rain patterns and experiencing drought. So there's a need for water reuse management and techniques and a need for food crop production, combined with lessening um, energy expenses as well. Um, so yeah, that'll be my future work in St. Thomas. Um, and in terms of professional development, we do a lot of work with science communication. So here we have um, just a few pictures and collections from all of the conference presentations that we've had. Um, so we make sure it is very clear that we are presenting our work in the public, which is a part of this presentation here today, um, so that people have a strong concept of what's going on. Um, so the picture on the left, was at the AEESP, which is the Association of Environmental Engineering Science and Professionals. Oh, actually, all three of them were at AEESP. Okay, great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we love environmental topics, but we do present in other places. Um, so we also have the science uh, policy um, network. So a few weeks ago, we had um, PhD candidates from Arizona the Arizona Science Policy Network's co-founders come and give a presen an excellent presentation on um, science communication and science policy. And we've also had Drew, who is a staffer for... Yeah, for the Delaware Congressman, who's a staffer. So he gave us really good techniques on communicating our science to laypersons because it's completely different than what you think of for publications. Um, so that picture in the upper right hand corner and on the right hand side was Drew talking to us about science, communicating science policy. Um, and then we had our Strong Coast meeting to also work on our science communication in our group. And then there's the money. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so with the funding, there's a few different ways to go about it, I guess. Um, a lot of the fellows will be funded through the Strong Coast program for a year um, and then go on to other funding opportunities, whether that's being a teaching or research assistant um, or on another program another fellowship program that the university has, which is GAN. Um, I'm not going to think of what that stands <laughs> for. Oh, it's right here. Um, <laughs> Graduate assistance. In areas of national need. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> um, so some of the students will also go on to that funding um, for a few years. <laughs> so we'll just kind of adding to that a little bit. So the um, funding package might look a little bit different depending on whether you are um, a doctoral student in anthropology or environmental engineering or potentially uh, marine sciences. And um, typically the, um, the Strong Coast funding um, is funding for a period of 12 months um, at 34,000. Um, so it's a significant stipend, um, but it is focused on um, that year that could potentially include uh, graduate coursework, uh, tuition waiver, and then uh, research uh, in the field. Um, and that usually is combined with another source of funding, either departmental teaching, uh, research assistantship, or um, uh, as Addie mentioned, another funding uh, from NSF or other sources. Um, and we also have, uh, we sort of, I guess, um, a USF funded trainee group as well. So um, those trainees have slightly different requirements as far as uh, coursework. Um, and then are integrated into uh, the uh, rest of the Strong Coast activities. So um, I'm sure that whoever's out there in the um, in the interwebs, uh, <laughs> you're really excited about joining us with this program. Uh, if you'd like to know more information, uh, this is some uh, these are some key links. Um, it's probably really useful to know uh, application deadlines. So um, in order to uh, be considered for the Strong Coast program, uh, the main uh, way that you can do that is by um, applying to the graduate program, PhD program in either applied anthropology or civil and environmental engineering. Uh, for anthropology, our deadline is coming up fairly soon, uh, December 15th for August 2020. And um, in your statement of purpose, you can specify that uh, you're interested in 
um, being considered as a strong coast trainee um, in your statement of purpose. Um, and I'm also the graduate uh, director in the Department of Anthropology. So um, again, my name is Rebecca Zarger, and you can contact me. I'm sure there'll be some info at the end of the webinar about that, um, but I'm happy to talk with you and answer questions. Um, for civil and environmental engineering, the application deadline is February 15th, um, and you can contact uh, Dr. Serena Ergus, uh, who is also um, a, a part of this grant and the graduate coordinator in civil and environmental engineering for more information about that. So these are just a few quotes um, that we've gathered just about the Strong Coast family. Um, we're actually a family. So the first one is Strong Coast has challenged me to adapt and become a culture where interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary and sustainably minded. Thanks, Abby. Christian, <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know if you want to read your sure, right here. It's a lot. It's a lot. It's a lot. So, my quote is the best part of being an anthropologist and an interdisciplinary team or engineers is having the opportunity to gain a holistic understanding of the food energy water nexus that incorporates meaningful community engagement with technological advance. Oh, advancements to create sustainable <laughs> solutions to issues related to climate change. And so, like, mine does sound more like an engineer. I was like, really, really <laughs> that was really appreciating it. My ability to engineer solutions that incorporate human variables has been my greatest takeaway from working with Strong Coast anthropologists and engineers embedded in the community. Huh. good. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Sign me up. <laughs> <laughs> so we really are a family, and we just want to thank you guys for joining us today. Um, so like we said, we have, um, you can contact Dr. Trotz and Dr. Zarger, visit our website, um, follow us on Twitter, um, Medium, and we also have an Instagram. And um, if you have any questions, now is the time. So we'll open it up to people who are here in the room and anyone who's online. Um, and we have some, there's some really fantastic blog posts by uh, many of the folks in the room today that um, go into a lot more detail about the specifics of the projects we heard about. Uh, so please check those out as well. Questions? Questions? <laughs> <laughs> oh, don't look at me like that. <laughs> I know you, you, you asked me. I'm ruminating. Okay. You can open it up to the people online too. Yeah. It um, looks like we have Megan Kramer online. If you're interested, please ask us a question. We're ready, ready to field. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, it was very clear. Um, Dr. Trotz, do you have anything that you would like to add? No, oh, thank you. I may have muted Megan, so I just unmuted her. <laughs> um, Megan, would you have questions for us? <laughs> can you hear me right now? Yes. Yeah, yes, we can. Okay. Okay. Wow. Um, yeah, I want to say thank you guys so much. I feel really special being like the only person. <laughs> That's tuning in. Um, no, I I have a ton more questions now. Um, I'm this was yeah really awesome and really exciting. Um, I guess some of my questions are more about acceptance. Um, if like for instance, are you allowed to apply more than once if you are not accepted um, in your first application? Um, yeah, yeah. There's no there's no limit. <laughs> on the, on the okay. application. So, um, yeah, and I guess, you know, just kind of building on that, um, thing on my graduate director hat, one of the things that um, is often helpful uh, in um, preparing the application, would you be applying to the Civil and Environmental Engineer program? Yeah, applying for the Environmental Engineering okay. program. Uh, so yeah. I, I reach out to the ground. So maybe get some advice about uh, strong statements of purpose, you know, what faculty really are interested in seeing. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, I think it's often 
not so much about uh, the specifics of what you're proposing to do, but just that you can have a, um, a clear kind of uh, description of your background and then the kind of research that you want to do and why uh, USF and Strong Coast might be a good place to carry out that, that research. Okay. Um, and then, so I know this uh, webinar was advertised as um, looking at applications for 2020. I, I'm currently in, not in the States, and I will be coming back in the fall of 2020. I'm interested in applying to USF for the spring of 2021. Um, is it too early to be thinking about applying for Strong Coast in 2021? Um, I think it's a good time to start thinking of applying, Megan, because we're going to be um, thinking of awards and we uh -huh. only have a limited number. And so we definitely would encourage you to apply, um, especially since you're coming back from Peace Corps service. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, I have started my application for um, this next February deadline. Um, and so, yeah, I'll make sure to include my interest in Strong Coast when I do that. Um, in the application, we actually have a section that says, are you interested in Strong Coast? And then it's just okay. that your essay would, as Dr. Zargo mentioned, would address, you know, this fuse nexus. Okay, yeah. awesome. And on our website, uh, there's uh, more detailed information about uh, sort of the, the coursework for uh, the, the two main degrees. Um, mm -hmm. and that would be good to check out as well. Okay, cool. Um, yeah. So is I'm. It's still a little unclear to me if when you're as a trainee in this program, is your whole PhD experience within this program, or is this um, more of like an additive to the rest of your PhD research? Um, I think it, it's uh, maybe a little bit both. <laughs> um, I mean, we, uh, you, you would be entering a degree program in either uh, environmental engineering or in anthropology, and then you do have to uh, complete the requirements for those degrees. Um, mm -hmm. But the Strong Coast program is um, sort of a community within the larger community where you can um, pursue coursework that's very relevant to, to your interests. Um, you can cross these sort of traditional uh, disciplinary silos and boundaries much more easily, um, and then get mentorship from faculty and uh, doctoral student peers on um, topics that, that you're interested in pursuing as well. So, um, so all the requirements to complete the, the degree, the PhD degree um, in, in both programs are all still the same, um, but oftentimes, just to give you, I guess, a little bit more concrete example, um, students might, for their electives uh, with those requirements, they might take Strong Coast courses for those electives. So it's um, it's not a situation where you have to like complete the degree and then do a lot of additional um, coursework, particularly if you come into the program um, at the beginning of your doctoral program, um, then you can. Uh, sort of dovetail your requirements and, and the strong coast requirements too. Okay. okay. Does that answer your question? So it's like you can kind of merge the, the standard sort of program with some of the coursework that is required to be a, a trainee for strong coast. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, also, so I've, I've learned about um, the environmental engineering program with a focus in international development that is offered at USF. Is this, would this be an either or situation where you would either do a focus in international development or you could do the Strong Coast program or is that something that could be combined um, together? I think they could be combined together. Okay. So we had, you know, had a strong focus on the places where we had um, <laughs> partnerships in terms of Belize and Barbados, but we do have one fellow, for example, Addy, um, who's working <laughs> in Madagascar. Um, and so it's sort of 
you know, it's also sort of a coastal island community um, and some of the issues are, are sort of um, blend very well with what we are dealing with in the coasts that we cover in the Caribbean and um, Florida. Okay. Great. It's all very fluid, okay? Yeah. <laughs> maybe, yeah, maybe Addie could just say something briefly about her experience in merging those two things. So. Yeah, so I definitely think it's possible. I, the, a lot of the people that do the international development focus um, are the Peace Corps students and master's students. Um, but Dr. Mahalzik, who's also part of the Strong Coast group, is like the head of that as well. And he'll, he's very willing to work with you and make things work. So, mm -hmm. like, really possible. Okay. Great. And so, to clarify, it is only awarded to this strong, the Strong Coast program is only awarded to PhD candidates. Um, so, not for master's students, correct? That is, um, that is correct. I think um, it, it kind of plays out a little bit differently in anthropology versus uh, engineering as far as, I guess, exactly where people are in the process of <coughs> master's and, and uh, PhD coursework. Uh, in anthropology, it, um, it's only doctoral students uh, that are um, part of the, the Strong Coast at, at the beginning of, of their joining. And eventually everyone, uh, <laughs> Is, is a doctoral student uh, as they participate in Strong Coast. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think for engineering, we have, um, it's normally you're applying to the PhD program, um, but mm -hmm. there is something happening along the way where students who are coming with just a bachelor's are getting the master's before continuing the PhD. Sort of. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And in anthropology, um, you are required to have a master's before you apply to the doctoral program. So. That's why it's all doctoral students in anthropology. Okay, great. Um, yeah, I think that as I process all this information, I'll have more questions. <laughs> well, let's see. Um, is there anything anyone else wants to add just for you know, the benefit of folks who are watching this down the road? I think really feel free to reach out to the professors here. Um, don't be afraid. I know I've met a lot of people who are reserved from applying, applying to PhD programs because they think that their GPA is not great or they're not qualified, but don't disqualify yourself. Just try. Like, and I've loved it. And now we're not co-sign something that I don't believe in. So um, I don't think this is a farce or anything that we're doing just because they asked us to come. Um, but I all think we genuinely love like being here and being a part of the Strong Coast family. We've all been able to like grow and learn in some tough moments and in really good moments. So I would encourage people, people are watching in the future, even now, like this is real, like, and this is really impactful work. So when you think about the impactfulness of your work, that, that this grant and being a part of these projects is something where your work can actually have an impact. Okay, well, that seems like a great note to end. <laughs> 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 Yay, team!